Okay. Yeah, so what a weekend that just happened. If you didn't, weren't able to get to Sunshine Coast, you probably regretted it. <laughs> it was pretty good. But uh, it, just, it just all happened so quickly, you know. So, um, yeah, it was just over before you knew it. But, uh, yeah, it was really good. I remember um, uh, Jason Parkin asked me, like, you know, was, was I excited about the new church? And I said, uh, you know, it's all just just it's kind of just calm, right? Because just life's just moving so quickly that it's hard for me to be excited about it. Or, uh, also, you, you know, you, you kind of think because you have a church to go to, you, you really don't uh, think, you, can't, you don't really think back to when you didn't have a church to go to that was, you know, believed the way you do. Like you, you, you sort of, um, yeah, come in and have a seat. So, um, you know, you sort of forget and you take it for granted that, you know, a church like this exists and, like, you can get behind, you're excited to invite people to. Uh, so I was saying that, uh, you know, but I, I, what, I was, what I was happy about and what I was really excited about is I knew, like, how happy the people in Caloundra were going to be, the people in the Sunshine Coast, because for them, you know, they, they've been wanting this church for a long time and looking forward to it. So I was really happy because I knew that it was a really good thing for them now that things are going to be set in order. And these are sort of the thoughts I was sort of sharing with them. So I didn't, I didn't really get too much time to prepare for tonight. So I was just going to sort of share and elaborate on some of the things I, I, I gave them to think about, um, just some words I shared with them uh, on the Saturday and on the Sunday. So on the Saturday, we had the Soul Winning Marathon. And, um, you know, we, we knocked a lot of doors, but it must have been not a very receptive area because we didn't see anybody call upon the name of the Lord. But one thing we, and even Kevin was drilling it in as well, is, you know, we don't want that to discourage us. And uh, I'll, I'll just share with you just the, the passage that I shared with them in John 4, uh, where Jesus talks here in, uh, further down. In verse 31, it says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. So he talks about that Jesus has this sustenance, right? Things that keep him going and keep him working in the work of the Lord. But he's not talking about a physical food, right? Because he hasn't eaten anything physical. It's something spiritual that keeps him going. Verse 33, Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So we don't want to necessarily look at the result and draw our sustenance from that. Yes, do we, do we rejoice? Do we get excited when people get saved? Of course we do. Of course we're happy when people call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. But if, you, if that's the meat that sustains you, then you're going to get discouraged really quickly, right? If you hit an area where you're not seeing a lot of people call upon the name of the Lord, because maybe that's a time to actually sow the seed. And look at what Jesus says as we continue. He says here, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. So there are people out there ready to be saved. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Look at this, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Verse 37, herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. So you see, so when, that, when we reap, when we, even when we reap somebody at the door, oftentimes that person has had the water, the, the seed sown, the seed watered and plant, you know, it's been planted, it's been watered, it's grown, and then we get to go there when it's white, ready to harvest and get to reap. And it says here, I send you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. But it's interesting here that it says here that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So we're not excited. We're not happy, obviously, when people get saved. Yeah, of course we're happy. Of course we want people. We want to see people saved. We want to reap as well. But what we want to learn from this is, is don't be discouraged. Don't just look at the results and draw your sustenance from that. You want to draw your sustenance from the fact that you are obeying God, you are keeping His commandments, and you're doing the will of your, the Father that sent me. And that was something that really Kevin harked on as well. 
you know, talking about, you know, his first uh, uh, meeting there uh, just this Sunday morning. Yeah, it, it feels like it was so long ago, but it wasn't. It was just this Sunday morning, and, and it's like an hour and a half plane ride, and we're back already. Um, and it, it doesn't really feel like you're in another state, honestly. It just feels like we just traveled to a regional town, and then we're just back because the, the, the plane ride is so quick. Um, just talking about the Great Commission. That's what he preached on this morning, you know, uh, you know, uh, preaching the gospel, baptizing believers, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Jesus has commanded them. And that was really how he set the tone in, at that first meeting. He had, and on Saturday as well, Saturday night after the Soul Winning Marathon, we, we shared, um, you know, a few of us from, from this church shared uh, our salvation testimony. I shared a few words, and then Kevin did. And then on Sunday, some of the guys from Caloundra, they shared their salvation testimony. And then I said a few parting words just before we left. And it really was because uh, it started at 9 o'clock and then it went to about 11. Uh, and, and then he was going to have some other men speak, but then I, I had to, like, we had to leave because we had to leave to go catch the plane. So I had to sort of, like, stop him and say, I have to say, if I'm going to say something, I have to say now because I'm going to have to leave. So... One thing I shared in my salvation testimony is I, I remember, you know, just just talking about this this sowing and, and reaping, and you know, we don't want to get discouraged if we don't necessarily get to reap. Yes, we rejoice together when people get saved, and it's a great thing, but we don't want it to discourage you. And I just shared it in my own salvation testimony that I remember uh, one one guy that really played a key part in in me having a different point of view of of what it meant to be a rational and reasonable Christian. I remember, you know, I went to, uh, you know, a, 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 a youth camp with my brother, and I remember, you know, sitting in those Bible studies, and they never really ended up being Bible studies and reflecting on the sermon because I wasn't saved. So then I was sitting in that group, and then it would just end up, you know, me asking questions and them trying to answer those questions. And I really felt at the time that, they, they really didn't answer them very well. You know, it's a sort of Christians where, you know, maybe you work with Christians like this or you know Christians like this, but they don't really know the Bible that well. They don't really know why they believe this. They just, you get the feeling that they just believe it just because they've grown up with it, you know, or they just believe it and they just, they don't really thought it through. It's just, oh, the Bible just says that, so I just believe it. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily, uh, you know, a bad thing. It's good to have that sort of faith, but I think God wants us to worship him with our mind and just think through things and know why we believe the things we do. Otherwise, why would he say, be ready to always give an answer to every man that asks you, asks you of the reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. So he wants us to know what we believe, why we believe it, be able to defend what we believe. You know, that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And I remember just during this time where I sort of thought, oh, you know, they don't really have very satisfying answers. I went with a friend to a to a large Pentecostal charismatic church, and not for the right reasons at all. We just went there just to sort of meet friends and meet girls and whatnot. whatnot. And I remember we were I was sort of waiting out in the lobby, you know, uh, and uh, a guy came over and he he offered to buy me a drink, and he said, "Oh, you want a drink?" And I said, "Oh, it's, you know, it's free." So you know, he bought me a drink, and we had the they had the cookies there and whatnot. And then he started talking to me. He asked me, you know, you know, why I didn't believe, you know, the gospel, why I didn't believe on Jesus. And we got sort of talking about evolution because at the time, you know, I was an atheist and, uh, you know, believed in evolution, believed that was reasonable. And he really debunked a lot of the things that I was throwing at out. And I was just kind of surprised because, you know, this guy was at this, this charismatic church where the guy was like slapping people on the forehead, rolling on the ground. And I'm just wondering, like, why? what's this reasonable guy doing at a church like this? Because even though I wasn't saved, my brother and I had talked about all these things, and I knew that this was not of God, you know, There's this holy rolling on the floor. and Because and, you'd see people just, like, on the floor. I don't know if you've ever been to these charismatic churches. Like, they, they literally get slapped on the forehead, and they fall back, and they're just, like, on the floor just, like, giggling. And it's like they're just losing control. And it's really kind of creepy if, if, if you don't... You know, if you're not sort of, you haven't bought into this whole idea that they're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're just looking at them, it's like, are these people are possessed or what? And you know, it's, it's not all real as well, because like, when you're actually there, you know, you see it on TV and everyone's just falling, you know, you know Benny Hinn just like, you know, swinging his jacket, just like, you know, people make those YouTube videos making fun of him, like throwing fireballs and whatnot. But, um, you know, you go to these churches, but you see the guy going down the aisle, like slapping people, right? But then you, you see, not everyone's actually falling over. I don't know if you, maybe if you, I'm not saying go to one of these, but I just remember I was there 
I'm just watching him go down. And, and you know, some people are falling back and, and doing all that stuff. But then other people, he just goes past and they're just like, nothing happens. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. Maybe some of them are faking it. Some of them are just possessed. I don't know. Um, where was I going with that? So, so uh, yeah. So this guy. So this guy. He's 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 pre, he was talk, talking to me and, and just debunking all these things. I really hope one day he's in heaven. I hope he's saved. But what that did for me, I remember, was just it, it just changed my perspective and just it made me realize, wow, like this guy actually believes in God. He believes in Jesus Christ, and yet he hasn't just blindly believed it in a sense. Like he actually had answers, and he, he was like a very reasonable person. So, you know, my, my point here is that, you know, he probably doesn't know what effect he's had in my life. You know, that just that one conversation where he bought me a hot chocolate, he had, we had a brief chat, maybe five, ten minutes, just gave me a few things to think about. But that's just something I've just always remembered in my life. And it actually played a really big part in just switching my thinking to think, oh, wow, you can actually believe on Jesus Christ and not have to leave your brain at the door because this guy... He actually had answers, and he played a big part in actually debunking atheism, atheism for me, as well as a lot of the other things that I've, I've watched along the way. So all that to say this, you know, the sower and the reaper, they can rejoice together. So you don't want to get discouraged if you spend a lot of time sowing, you know, but, you know, we want to reap as well, obviously, right? But then sometimes when we reap, it's because other people have done that work, and then we get to come and be the reaper in that scenario and rejoice together. So the point being, you know, don't don't get discouraged, you know, just from the result. You know, the result's great, and you know we can rejoice over it, and we can look at the numbers and things like that. But if you only focus on the results, right, you're going to get discouraged, and you're going to be weary in well doing. So we don't want to be weary in well doing because we will eventually reap if we faint not. So we need to keep fighting the good fight, in season, out of season, whether we feel like it or not. Now, the other thing I wanted to share with you guys that I that I talked about over in the Sunshine Coast, and I really hope that you know our churches do work together. You know, we when we were just traveling back, uh, you know Nathan, Peter, and I were just talking about oh, you know, it'd be good to sort of do things together. We talked about different ministries that might might be possible, and even um, you know I think what's really good about sometimes getting away from just just your every day and, and michael's pro probably knows as well I, I i don't know so much if it's the same with going back to the czech republic because you don't really have a church to go there to and it's not that sort of thing so um but you know i'm sure i'm sure it's very refreshing just getting away from the daily grind and you know and i was saying this to peter and nathan you know some churches you're like camped and retreated to death in the sense that you know there's just like camps going on like every month and retreats going on and there's and sometimes you can go a bit overboard with, with events and whatnot. But when I think back at my spiritual growth and my early church days, I think there was a really big benefit to having like a yearly sort of family camp, you know, where you sort of, you just get away from it all for a bit. You go and you listen to some preaching. You might learn about dating and children and marriage and just, just be reminded, just refocus. And sometimes that just sort of helps because it's just so easy to just get into the daily grind. You know, I'm sure you guys know exactly what I mean, right? And that's why church is so important, because church is important. We get back, we get into the Word, we remind ourselves to, to, to do the work and our purpose here, because when you go to work, you just remember, you just forget. You're just in the daily grind, just working and doing your thing, and the love of God starts to grow cold, the focus, the, the reminder of what your purpose here is is actually to do because what is our purpose here right it's to glorify god right and bring forth much fruit that's the whole idea that's why it's great what kevin preached he set the tone of the church of, hey to remind people that we have a great commission as believers to do and let's not let that great commission be the great omission they say you know that it's the one thing that christians aren't doing because they're so busy doing everything else we need to be more proactive. We need to be a brighter light. The light of Christianity is getting very dim in our country, and it's got to start with us. You know, you can't you can't just point to the, the other Christians and say, "Where are all the Christians doing all these things?" Well, you know, where are you on Sunday? 
know, where are you on Saturday soul winning? Where are you? You know, where you should be reading your Bible, you should be studying the Bible, learning more. You know, you're just wasting your time doing leisurely things and doing all that stuff. You, you have too much leaves on your tree rather than the fruit on your tree. So, you know, we, we, we look at the world, we look at Australia, we look at how, you know, our communities are going, and we complain and complain and complain. But it's got to start here, guys. It's got to start with us. You know, and it doesn't, if, if, if you're not willing to change, don't, don't expect the society to change. You know, if, if society's got to change when you're willing to change. You be the change in the church. You be the change in this world. And then you can start expecting society to change because now you'll actually be doing something about it rather than us just, you know, looking at the world and just complaining all the time. Um, but really not being willing to make a difference. Uh, so let's go to, to Romans 16. I just want to um, share with you a couple of other thoughts that I shared with them. And it's always, this is something I feel always needs to be reminded in a church because we just get comfortable and we start sort of backsliding and we have to remember that, you know, that we are the church. You know, like I'm talking about in society and making a difference. Like, I mean, if we, if we are not willing to do anything different, if we're not willing to work for God, work in the church, work to make a difference, we can't really expect things to change. And it's no different in church. Like, if, if we don't get more involved, if we, if we don't get behind the vision of this church, the work of this church, and, and, are, and are actually involved to make this happen, to encourage one another, you know, go soul winning and, and make the soul winning program a success, then, you know, what, what, what do we expect? You know, like we, we're not willing to do something. We can't expect it to su succeed if we're not actually doing anything about it. Let's look in Romans 16 here. Uh, let's just read a couple of verses here uh, throughout the chapter. But it says here, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Sancria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. And as we read through Romans 16, and I've done this before, there's a lot of names that are mentioned. And I want you to just think about the church in Rome and, and the reason why all these names are being mentioned, because these are all the people that are involved to make the, 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 the church in Rome such a success to the point where we read in Romans 1, I won't turn there just now, but you know, in Romans 1, Paul praises the Roman church saying, you know, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. He's saying, I thank God for you guys because your, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Can, can you believe that? That, that, that it's, He's saying everywhere in the world, everybody knows the faith that, that, that the Roman church has. And why is that? Was it because there was just, it was just a one-man band that was just getting everything done? You know, even if you think about the churches now, you know, and I won't, I won't mention any names, but you know, even churches now where there, you know, you think of a cert, certain individual that sort of runs that ministry, and it's, and it's not necessarily just independent Baptist churches, but just ministries where you know there's generally one spokesperson. Even you know, with political parties, generally there's a one spokesperson. But they're not making everything happen. The reason why they're able to become that public and do these great works is because they have great teams behind them in the background making all these things happen. You know, they just happen to be the face of that organization or face of that business or whatnot. But if, if you, I'm sure if you were to ask any of them, do they do all these great works just on their own? No, of course not. They recognize the people that are behind them, supporting them, getting all that stuff done in order for them to do that. And it's it's no different in a church, right? It's no different here, with even with Paul. You know, this is one reason why I think Paul writes these things under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, where he's recognizing the people in Scripture, praising them for the work that they do, um, even though, you know, he's generally known as, you know, this great evangelist. But even he, he is not alone, we'll see in here. So even with here, he commands Phoebe, our sister. So is it, you know, if you're a lady in a church and you just think, oh, you know, it's just, it's just men, they're the ones that are running everything and doing all the great things. No, right? So just because you're a lady, that doesn't mean you can't be in charge of anything. Yeah, okay, ladies don't, aren't be, or aren't, don't hold the office of a bishop. They're not the leaders, right? They're, they're not the bishops, they're not the deacons, but that, does that mean they don't have any responsibilities? No. And even Phoebe here, he sends Phoebe from the church which is at St. Crea to go help the church in Rome. And he even, under the authority of the church leaders, right, Paul, he says, hey, you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. It's kind of like when I sent a lady 
in charge of the kitchen ministry, it might be like, hey, help Christina get that done, right? And Christina might now have the authority to say, hey, help with this, do that, do that this way. But ultimately, the authority comes from the leadership in the church. So the, the pinnacle in the church shouldn't be women. But that doesn't mean women aren't given responsibilities and can't do great works. He says here, for she had been a succorer of many and of myself also. Just to succor somebody is to support and to assist them to do great things. So even women in the church can play a huge part in why it is successful here. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So this was a husband and wife couple. And look at this, who have, lay, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Isn't this amazing that this is a this is a married couple, Priscilla and Aquila. I don't know, if, you know, did they have young kids? I'm not too sure, right? But maybe they were older and didn't have young kids. Who knows, right? We're not we're not really told. But I think one thing we can glean from here is I, it's like it's almost like Priscilla and Aquila are used as the example of of what a marriage should be, in the sense that they're a married couple, Priscilla and Aquila, and them being married didn't take them away from the work of the Lord, which is often what we see, unfortunately, in a lot of churches where, you know, you have young people serving the Lord, really involved, and then they get married, and then they're not as involved. And you kind of think, well, you know, I thought in everything we're meant to glorify God. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Our marriage is no exception. So we, we as when we're young and we're single, we're serving the Lord, we want to look for somebody to marry that we can also work together to serve the Lord. And we see here Priscilla and Aquila, they were a married couple, and look at the effect that they had, not only in Paul's life where they did things that where they risked their own life in certain instances, but he says here, not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house, Right, so not only that, but they were hospitable to the point they opened up their house to the church to be used where there was a meeting going on there. Salute my well beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Now, whenever I read about Eponidas here, and it says the first fruits of Achaia, I think about new believers. Right, where you know it's you so you've got uh, you know you've got uh, what are we talking about you know the ladies in church where Phoebe's kind of representative there Priscilla and Aquila like a married couple then you've got uh, uh, Eponetus who kind of in my mind represents like a new believer right they 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 you know Achaia is a first fruit and it shows here that even a new believer somebody who hasn't been in the faith for a very long time can still have a part to play in making a church a great success. So don't just think, oh, you know, oh, I'm just a new believer, I'm not going to get involved. No, no, you get involved as well. Even if you're a new believer, you'll be a, you can be a blessing and do great things and you'll be recognized here by God as somebody that played a part in making that a success. You know, greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. You know, is that maybe just a single lady or maybe an older lady or a widow or who knows? Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, and look at this, who also were in Christ before me. So when I read that, I think, hey, these guys, they're not new believers. They're people that have been in the faith for a long time, even before Paul, right? He's saying here, these guys who are note among the apostles have been in the faith even before me, right? Even at the point where he's writing this Roman, Roman epistle, right? So these guys are older believers, and to me, when I read that, it's, it's almost like I think of older believers that have been in the faith for a long time, and sometimes I hear them say things like this, I used to be really involved in church, really involved in the soul thing back when I was younger. Right? But that were the, those were those days, right? back when those days where I was you know, really involved. But is that, should that be the case? You know, like, uh, like the, those of us who are more mature in the faith, we should be an example to those younger in the faith and show them not only what it means when I was young to serve God, but what it means to serve God when I'm also older as well. To, to be that example is to show, hey, it's not just, uh, just, I'm not just like a flash in the pan, serve God when I'm young and now I take it easy, but I want to set the example of how I'm going to serve God throughout my life and be faithful all the way to the end. Like Paul says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished my course with joy. So these guys, look, they're, and they're not doing just, you know, taking the easy road. 
Because he says here, my kinsmen are my fellow prisoners. Right? So it's not like, you know, and you're young, you're doing all the crazy stuff, right? And doing all the risky things. These guys, you know, even when they're older, they're taking some chances too. They're going to fall to some dangerous place where they're thrown in prison together and whatnot. So keep that in mind. Let that encourage you. Like, you know, God is, God is listing these people here to show us some examples and praising them. And we ought to, to take heed to that. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute, obey. And obviously, I don't know all the stories behind all these people. Uh, our helper in Christ and Sacchi's my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them, which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. So when I see these people, Aristobulus and Narcissus, I think of people that actually have a lot of people that answer to them, people of influence. Right? And generally, people of influence, they are easily carried about with the cares of this world. Right, But then, even the Bible says, well, you know, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be willing to communicate, you're ready to give, that sort of thing. So, just because people are successful as well, they have more to be accountable for, right? Because they have more. They have more influence. And we see here two people, Aristobulus and Narcissus, where they were that good example, because their whole household was also serving the Lord, right? And, and the household, not necessarily just their family, but it could be servants and maids as well, people that answer to them. Um, you know, so in our day and age, you might be you know, successful businessmen, right? They have a lot of people that answer them. They're still taking a stand for the Lord and being a blessing in their local church. Salute Trifena and Trifosa, who labor in... Oh, just another thought as well. You know, generally people that run their own businesses, you think about, what, what, what about with them as well? They sort of are very busy, aren't they? Generally, people that run their own business, they dedicate all their life running this business, working 70, 80 hours a week, and generally they'll say, well, I don't have time for church because I have to work on Sunday, I have to do that. But we see here where people running households still very involved in the church at Rome there and making that a success. Salute Trifena and Trifosa who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, we labored much in the Lord. Look, these, these are now listing some really hard-working people. We don't know about them, but we know that they're laboring in the Lord, laboring much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. I was just reading that today, and I was just thinking, is he saying that it's Paul's mother like <laughs> at the church in Rome? I don't know. If you guys understand what that's saying, I'm, 100%. I'm thinking like hey, Rufus's mother and mine. So is he just saying... Rufus's mother is his mother, or he treats him like his mother, or, or, is, or is Paul's mother actually at Rome, and she also, you know, is serving the Lord, which is great. So maybe Paul had an influence on his family there too. I don't know, I'm just guessing there. Uh, salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. I read this group of names and I figured these are the guys, right? These might be the young guys in the church. You know, you always have like in every church, there's always like a group of young guys, right? They're, they're good mates. Um, you know, this is almost like the, the group of young guys, the Syncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. And then here, then you have the girls. Salute Philologus, I think, I think these are all the girls, and Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. I wonder if that's like a you know, group of young men and a group of young ladies. Salute one another with a an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So I remember, I know I've said this before, it's just a reminder tonight, but I remember learning about Romans 16, and uh, it was always said to me, it's just like this random list of names, it's just like listed at the end of Romans. But, you know, no, as you actually look through it, it's almost like you can see, you know, these are, these are people that are being pointed out as examples to follow that are being praised and also to show that the reason why the church in Rome was such a great church is because there were so many people involved, so many people making it happen. That's why their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. So you read here, and there's a few purposes, right? There's the, there's, we, we learn here that you know, it's biblical to recognize people that are doing a great work in the Lord. You know, obviously, you know, we don't praise ourselves. You know, we don't toot our own horn. Like they kind of, it's like a philosophy you have to learn at work, right? Where you kind of have to you know, sort of drop hints here and there of things you do to sort of get ahead. But in the Christian life, that's not how it is. You know, the Bible says that let another mouth praise thee, right? So here we see it's biblical that if somebody is doing a great work, you know, they ought to be praised for it. You ought to tell people, hey, you're doing a good job. You know, you're doing a great work. Uh, and recognize them and honor them uh, in the congregation. Uh, not only that, like I said, we see 
the number of people making it work uh, at the church in Rome. But another thought I want to leave you with as well is you may be doing something in the church and nobody is recognizing that job, right? You're just doing something and nobody really knows that you do it. Nobody really, really knows that it gets done. But one thing I see here is that it shows the heart of God as well, that he sees that done. You know, even in Ephesians, it says that any good thing uh, that we do, like God sort of sees that. He rewards that, right? So it's another thing where he sees specific names in a church being mentioned. And when I, when I read this as well, it sees, hey, you know, God sees the things that I do, even though man doesn't see it. And that ought to encourage you and ought to help you to continue to serve the Lord even if you're not necessarily getting the praise that you think um, is due uh, for, that, for that work. Now let's go on to a bit further down. I want to show you here that not only in the church in Rome is, uh, is um, not only in the church in Rome is there a lot of work going on, a lot of people involved making that happen, but also, even with Paul, like I sort of already mentioned it already, that we think of, oh, Paul, this great evangelist, this great preacher, but you need to realize he also was not a one-man band. And he often recognized people that worked with him. And even in Romans 16, sort of like this chapter, just sort of recognizing these different people and going through these different examples, we see even Paul mentioning people that worked with him. Look at this. Timotheus, my work fellow and Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. So you see, Paul had people traveling with him as well. Remember, Luke also traveled with him, helping him. Verse 22, I always find this verse so interesting. It says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So, you know, when you think of the New Testament, you think of the epistles of Paul, and you think that Paul just wrote them all? No, he didn't actually write his own list. It's almost like he, didn't, he had people help him write the letters. And I think in, maybe in this day and age, it's almost like somebody takes on the task to transcribe sermons. You know, that happens now in a lot of churches where somebody might take on the, the, take on the task and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to transcribe the sermon so that the sermon has subtitles or translate the sermon and do that sort of work uh, rather than the preacher having to do that all himself. So it's like he says, I churches here who wrote this epistle salute you in the Lord. So Paul oftentimes, I think, didn't even pen down his own writings. Now, in Galatians, you'll notice at the end of Galatians, he does actually mention, you see how large a letter I've written with mine own hand. Because that was a very important letter. That, that letter was preaching against work salvation, preaching against people adding works, so adding circumcision to salvation. And that topic was so important to him, you know, where he writes, you know, if you think that you have to keep the law to be saved, Christ shall profit you nothing. And at the end, he says, I actually wrote this with my whole hand. So he wrote himself the Galatian letter. But he didn't write the Roman letter, right? Tertius wrote it for him. Um, and he's saying here, I, I Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host. So you see, Paul was taken care of by other people. He didn't, he didn't necessarily have his own place to stay. People put him up, right? And, and he mentions here, Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, salute us you, salute you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Quartus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So let me just finish on this point um, because I didn't think I'd actually take that long to go through that. I thought it was a quicker point than I thought. But um, I'll just finish on this thought because this is what I was sharing with the church in Caloundra. Where in 1 Corinthians 12, we sort of talk about here the body of Christ and the different members making up that body. And we can learn a lot of principles about uh, the body of Christ. But one thing I really wanted them to reflect on is in verse 27, when the Bible says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And, and the Bible doesn't. The Bible says here that ye are the body of Christ. And so the church, which is the body of Christ, is you, the people. It doesn't say... Now they are the body of Christ, as though it's somebody that's not you. Because sometimes we get this impression, and this is why I'm sharing Romans 16 with you, that the reason why a church is successful, and the reason why things happen is because you make it happen. You know, like it's like this church here, like this happened because, you know, God used me to make this happen. 
right? It just, this doesn't just happen automatically. Sermons don't just get uploaded to YouTube automatically. Sermons don't just write themselves and things like that. Like these things happen. Like somebody has to organize these things. And it's like in any church, if the work's going to get done, it's the people within the church that make it happen. So we don't want to have this attitude where it's they are the body of Christ, right? Where we don't realize we are part of this body. And the example I was sharing was, it's like when you see something that needs to get done. Either it needs to be cleaned up or put away or something neatened up and straightened or you, you see somebody struggling. Like let's say you see Christina in the kitchen. She's struggling, right? And you don't sort of sit there just thinking, well, you know, they need to put more people in the kitchen ministry. You just, just jump in there and make it happen. You know, like let's say we're about to eat and you can see that the tables aren't set up. You can see that, you know, the, the stuff's not put out or whatnot and, you know, everything's going on. You don't just have this mentality that they are going to do it. No, the, the, ye are the body, not they are the body. We, we, we have to make out. We don't do it, and it doesn't get done, right? So ye are the body of Christ, not they are the body of Christ. We, we are the body. We make it happen. We're the, we are the church. And we need to realize that when we think about what, what we want our church to be, right? Do we want our church to be, you know, an ignorant church, you know, a, a church that doesn't know the Bible, well, if you don't want that, then you can't be ignorant. You need to know the Bible. You need to be studying the Bible. If you want a church to be a soul-winning church, you know, do you like going to a church that preaches the gospel that's soul-winning? Well, it's, it's a soul-winning church because ye are the body of Christ. It's not they go soul-winning. You have to go soul-winning. If we want this church to be a soul-winning church, we, want, we need to make sure we're going. And it's the same if we want to be a friendly church, right? If we come here and people think, hey, this church is really welcoming, it's really friendly, you have to be friendly. You see, so it's you are the body of Christ. You are the, the you are the face of this church. And and sometimes you know people may come to this church. They might meet just one of you. They might not meet everybody. But that's how they think of the church, right? It's no different. In, it's like in business, right? That's why customer service is so important because that's it's like the face of the company. And we need to take that on board when we think about what we want this church to be. It's not hey, they need to do this. No, ye are the body of Christ. We are the ones that make this happen. And that's what we are seeing in Romans 16, where everybody is getting involved. And that's why their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Anyway, I hope that's a good reminder for you. It's something that really needs to be just talked about, reminded uh, every now and then that, you know, hey, we're the ones that are going to make this happen. And if we, uh, you know, if we start backsliding, we, we're not as involved as we should be. We know there's things we ought to be doing that we're not, then that's where the church is going to go. Um, so we need to make sure that we are serving God uh, with everything we have. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you uh, for just the, the examples you give us in the Bible, the exhortation. Lord, uh, and even the different types of people in Romans 16, that Lord, it applies to us in almost every stage of our life. So we thank you, Lord, um, for giving us the instruction. I pray, Lord, that we would really internalize this, that, Lord, we would realize that we are part of a body, that, Lord, we have an effect on the body, and, Lord, we also play a big part in the success of of the work this body does. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us, give us your grace, give us wisdom, Lord. Help us to not be carried about with the thorns of this life. Help us to refocus, help us to, con help us to know our purpose, which is to bring forth much fruit for you. And we thank you, Lord. We, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.